Amen. 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 Well, good morning. Welcome. How many of you are uh, new this week that weren't here last week? Oh, probably about half. Okay. Um, we're on walking on the road to Emmaus, exploring the Lord Jesus in the New and in the Old Testaments. But I mean that also in the Old Testament, the Lord Jesus in the Old Testament. Uh, Dan and I always begin all of our sessions whenever we have an opportunity to share with the words of Martin Luther, Sola Scriptura, by Scripture alone. Anytime you're in a, uh, a class or a sermon or whatever where the speaker is talking to you from, from the Scriptures, you have to hold their words to a very strict biblical standard. If they can't make a strong biblical case for what they're sharing with you, you should be very you know, you said at the least, at the very least, you have to be cautious because you know all all people are are fallible. So we we have to be, you know, every every time someone shares with you, you have to hold their words, uh, you know, to the truth of the Bible. So I think that a lot of what we're going to share with you, particularly today, uh, a lot of it is is uh, is our own interpretation, and there's a lot of different interpretations of Scripture. That's why we have so many denominations. But uh, I, I do believe that we'll be able to make a fair biblical case, at least based on a fair reading of the original text. So sola scriptura by scripture alone. Dan and I also believe, and Dan Diamore, my, my partner with Circuit Writers, who, who does all the hard work, and uh, he's in the back. Um, we also think that it's of great value, as much as you can, through the eyes of a 21st century, probably Gentile, we're probably all Gentiles here, uh, to try to look at scripture as much as you can through Jewish eyes. Every one of the writers of the New Testament was a first century Jew, with the probable exception of Dr. Luke, who was a Greek, but he was at least a Jew in his training. He, he was a proselyte, an initiate in the Jewish faith, and accompanied Rabbi Saul, the Apostle Paul. Uh, so God is the author of Scripture, but I believe that he gave his word through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the various writers, who then in turn gave it to us through their Jewish frame of reference. And I think a lot of times we lose some of the nuances, some of the subtleties, uh, when we don't look at it to the original Jewish eyes. Uh, so again, I think it helps amplify the text. You'll see a lot of that today and in the coming weeks. I also, and I, and I just say this uh, just, just to give you a warning at the front, when we're talking about eyes, those of you that are friends of mine know that I have very poor vision, and uh, uh, I have a very difficult time reading my own slides. Uh, I used to be a, a, a prodigious, avid reader. Now I read like a three-year-old. Or at least a third grader anyway. But uh, So I'll try to struggle through this as well as I can. There's a lot of reading today, but just bear with me. But looking through Jewish eyes, thank God not looking through my eyes. So when I was in grad school, I, I just want to start with this, which is what we started with last week, which is why I asked how many were here. When I was in grad school in the history department, my thesis advisor told all of us, there were maybe 25 uh, individuals in the room, we were all working on our master's thesis, historians in the history department. And our professor, our thesis advisor said, I'm gonna put each one of you in a time machine and send you back in time anywhere you want to go. You can only go one place. You can choose one place in history. You'll be invisible. You can't get hurt. You'll know the language, where would you go? Well, you could go around the room and you could pretty much gauge what each individual was doing for their thesis. One guy said he wanted to go to Pickett's Charge at Gettysburg. Well, he was doing his thesis on the Civil War. You know, you can kind of tell what it was. What well, got to me, and I said, well, I know where I'd go. He said, okay, Bill, where would you go? He says, well, I'd go on the road to Emmaus. And he all looked at me like, the road to Emmaus? What, what, what is that? You know, this guy had three heads. Where would you go? I mean, think about that. There's some place that you would go back in time. Probably with this group, I imagine a lot of it would be biblical. You go back to some biblical Thing. But with me, the road to Emmaus was was the, the thing, and I told it. I told the group, I said it was the greatest lecture, the greatest speech ever given in the history of man, because it was Jesus telling them everything about Himself that was written about Him in the Old Testament and the Law, the Prophets, and the Psalms. The Old Testament is all about Jesus from start to finish. And for those of you that were here last week, we we went from the very first verses of Genesis. Jesus is found in the very first three verses of of Genesis, and found in the last three verses of Revelation. It's seamless from start to finish. So the road to Emmaus. I, as a quick digression, though, I did mention to those people that were here last week, in preparation for this class, uh, when I when I wanted to start with this road to Emmaus concept, my thesis advisor, my old professor, uh, what I had done last week, we had we had we talked about Gamaliel, who was the uh, head of the rabbinic school that Paul, Rabbi Saul, went to his rabbinic school, and he was Paul's mentor. And there's a tradition I shared last week 
that when Paul became a Christian, a believer, he went back to Gamaliel, who we read about in the book of Acts, and witnessed to his old mentor about Jesus. We don't know for sure that that happened, but I think it's, it's plausible. It would certainly make sense that he would do that. And I think I'd mentioned to the group that in preparation for the class, I was thinking about my old mentor, my old thesis advisor. We were very close friends. And I wrote him last week. I was telling Eileen the other, the other night, um, and I wrote him last week. He's, he's 90 years old now. He's not a believer. He's a Greek. And I wrote at the very end of the letter, Christos Anesti, Christ is risen in Greek. And he would always respond, Alithos Anesti, he is risen, see, risen indeed. He would know the drill. He was brought up Greek. But uh, he wrote me a letter back this week. And as I saw Elaine, it was it was amazing. Just that uh, uh, he he said he read all the stuff that I sent. You don't know. We can't we can't convert anyone. We only can make the introductions. But that's incumbent on us to do that. So I was very delighted to say that he actually wrote me back, and he was very pleased with the letter. So we'll see what, what comes of that. So last week uh, we heard the testimony of the Lord Jesus. We, we call the Lord Jesus to the witness stand. And and for those of you that were here. The, the New Testament is replete with, with statements from Jesus where he claims to be God. There's no question about it that he claims to be the Son of God, equal with the Father and the Holy Spirit and the uh, Trinity. So Jesus is in the Old Testament, and the way we see Jesus in the Old Testament is the word theophany, that he's the theophany, he's the pre-incarnate Jesus. There's a number of times, and we're going to talk about this repeatedly through the next uh, uh, 10 weeks, uh, where Jesus actually even physically appears as the theophany and the pre-incarnate Christ in the Old Testament. Uh, during our journey along the road to Emmaus, we'll discover numerous times where we see that. And theophany really comes from the Greek word theophania, which means the appearance of a God, the appearance of a God. That's the actual translation. So here's Jesus appearing in the Old Testament in a number of cases. One quick example would be uh, when he's with uh, the two angels and he visits Abraham uh, in the tent. Okay, that was Jesus as the Theophany. There's many of them. We're going to talk about them more as the weeks go by. So finding Jesus in the Exodus today. We're going to try to find Jesus in the Exodus. Wow, I've never thought of Jesus being in the Exodus. Well, we talked about it last week. Jesus clearly was in the Exodus in his pre-incarnate form in the appearance of the burning bush. Remember, we talked about that last week for those of you that were here. And I'll just reprise this. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent, you to, sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. Now we talked about that and we know that the, this is what it would be in Hebrew, reading from right to left, this would be Yahweh, Yahweh, which we believe is the, is the pronunciation. The name was so sacred to the Jews that we don't even really know the exact pronunciation because they would never, they would never say it out loud. And uh, but we believe it's it's Yahweh that we believe that that would be I am in the Hebrew. And reading from right to left, this would be it. It's the Tetragrammaton Y H W H Yahweh. Or reading from right to left, Yahweh. And this would be it in Greek. And if you have a Greek Bible or the the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it would be Ego A Me I am I am. So the name of God. I am. Now, where this is really clearly Jesus in his pre-incarnate form is he references this in John chapter 8, verses 52 through 59. I'm not going to go through this in detail. We did this last week, but I want to reprise this. Jesus replied, he's talking to the Pharisees. And the Pharisees, of course, are, are trying to trap him and they're, and they're insulting him and they're, they're having all kinds of uh, back and forth. But Jesus replied, your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. Ha, you are not yet 50 years old, they said to him, and you have seen Abraham? Very truly I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. And they know that he claimed to be God, the God of the burning bush. Why? Because they immediately then pick up stones to try to stone him for blasphemy because he claims to be God. So clearly Jesus now is claiming to be the I am of the burning bush. 
It's one God. It's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It's one triune God. But here he is clearly in his pre-incarnate form. So Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever, Hebrews 13. So finding Jesus in the Exodus. In the land of Egypt. Now, Joseph and his brothers and all the generation died. But the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in number, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Then the king came to power, a new king came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. Slaughter of the innocent boys. And then we have the birth of Moses. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she said uh, she hid him for three months. But when she could not hide him any longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slaves to get it to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. And he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Moses. Now this is his own words in Deuteronomy. Since then, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, who and did all those signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do in Egypt. For no one has ever shown the mighty power or performance of the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of the Israelites. I have to do a quick digression here. I was with a friend of mine in Rome. We were in the Vatican. We were just doing a tour uh, one afternoon. We were just going to some different basilicas. And uh, as you know, if you have a Roman Catholic background, the Roman Catholics always believe that they have relics of some saint or something that they'll have an actual piece of a, uh, a bone of a, of, a, of a saint or a piece of the true cross or something like that. I mean, I don't want to make light of it, but, but it, to me it's kind of nonsensical. But what they do in this particular case is we were in a, in, a, in a basilica called the Basilica of St. Peter in Chain. And they claim to have the manacles, the chains, that Peter wore when he was in the prison before he was, behead, before he was crucified. <coughs> and we walked in, and there was this big, uh, uh, beautiful altar. And inside was, this, uh, was a lit-up glass case and these really nasty-looking manacles, handcuffs, that they claim to be Peter's handcuffs from 2,000 years ago. And I looked to the right, and as close as the wall is right here was Michelangelo's Moses. Not a reproduction. The actual original, that statue, was right there. We had no idea when we walked into this church. So it's an amazing thing. So I took that picture, and I think that's Moses, uh, the way uh, Michelangelo saw him. <laughs> now, does anything strike you about this story about the slaughter of the innocent children? Is there any New Testament parallel to that? I'm sure you know already. It's clearly Herod the Great when Herod decided that he wanted to slaughter all of the infant boys, two years old or younger, thinking that he would be able to kill the Messiah. So you see a parallel there already. Now, the reason I think it's interesting is Moses, and again, his own words, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. The Lord said, I will put my words in his mouth. 
he will tell them everything I command him. So here's Moses now telling them as he's leaving them in the end of Deuteronomy that there's going to be a prophet someday that's going to come. He's talking here about the Messiah. And we know that because Peter actually references this. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. So clearly, again, we have this parallel, the Old Testament to the New. And don't, don't get me wrong. Moses is the servant of Jesus. Jesus is God. Moses is a prophet. I'm not trying to compare the two in that sense, but only that God said that there would be someone who would come later who would have the authority of Moses, but then far exceeded, of course, and that everyone had to listen to his words. So well-kept secret. Now, this is, I think, kind of a fun thing looking through Jewish eyes. You be the judge. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to, the, to where uh, uh, his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Looking this way and that, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Now he's the prince of Egypt. Remember, his mother, his adopted mother, is the queen of Egypt, or the, the daughter of the pharaoh, princess of Egypt. He's a prince of Egypt. So question is, why is he trying to defend a Jewish person? Why does he, why does he think uh, that the Hebrews are his people? How did Moses, the prince of Egypt, know that he was really a Hebrew. Any ideas? Did you ever think about that? Did you ever reflect when you watched, when you watched uh, Charlton Heston beating the, uh, the guy in uh, the Ten Commandments? Yeah. And uh, Yul Brenner then sending him off into the wilderness? Yeah. Well, the answer is very simple. He was circumcised. He was a Jew. He was a Hebrew. That's why when they, she drew him out of the water, she knew he was a Jew, a Hebrew because he was circumcised. That had to be one of the best kept secrets in all of Egypt, because if anybody would have seen him in the locker room, think about that, he wouldn't have been the prince any longer. I always thought that was kind of perplexing, but isn't that true, doctor, doesn't that make sense? So we know that he was circumcised. Looking through Jewish eyes, you come up with some crazy things. Circumcision was God's unique way of setting apart his holy people. Even Christ Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day. I think this is amazing. The Lord commanded that the infant boys must be circumcised on the eighth day. We have a lot of medical people here. Well, I understand it. This was taken from uh, uh, from a actual medical journal that the first day after birth that the human blood adequately begins to clot is the eighth day. If you circumcise the boy before the eighth day, he bleed to death. None of this is accident. I mean, it's all by, by uh, design, all by clever design. And, of course, Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day. Now, how many remember reading about the Lord Jesus battling Pharaoh? Well, no, you probably didn't. But, again, remember now, who's the God of the burning bush? Well, it's Jesus in his pre-incarnate form. So when he tells Moses to go back and battle Pharaoh, the inference would be then that he's really in his pre-incarnate form. He's directing the, the plagues that are rained down on Egypt. And as I said last week, somebody said, this is Jesus kind of chubby. It's my favorite. Was that you that said that? Yeah. And uh, it's my favorite painting of, of uh, Jesus. This is Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel. I love, I love that. When I pray, it, it's always in my mind, Tim. I, I love this painting of Christ. Oh, so the Lord said to Moses, you are to say everything I command you and your brother Aaron to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of the country. But I will then harden Pharaoh's heart and he will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and with mighty acts of judgment, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. Here's Charlton Heston, let my people go. And Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh as the Lord had hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he would not let the children of Israel go out of the land. So we have the ten plagues, and you're very familiar with the ten plagues of the Exodus. The ten plagues. Interestingly enough, though, the pre-incarnate Christ, literally, I would argue, was involved with this. And here's where it all comes together. God's righteous anger was used both to bring justice, but also to save his people. 
it was focused not only against evil men, but it was also focused against evil demons. God said to Moses, I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. Not just Pharaoh and the people, but on the gods of Egypt. Each one of the ten plagues, each one of the ten plagues also was aimed at one or more of the false Egyptian deities. The following list attributes each plague to the false deity that it symbolically destroyed, the Egyptian god that was symbolically destroyed, proved to be powerless by each of the ten plagues. The very first plague was turning the water of the Nile turned into blood. Remember, Charlton Heston throws the staff down and the water turns into blood. Now, the Egyptians had the god Hapi, who was the Nile god, the god Kanum, the god of the source of the Nile, and Osiris, who was the god of the dead, whose very bloodstream was believed to be the river Nile. None of those three gods could prevent the water being turned into blood and make it back to water again. So he's already clearly shown that these gods, these gods are powerless by this plague. Look at the next one. It was the frogs. Well, Hecht was the frog-headed god of fertility. Of course, the land is covered in frogs, and he couldn't stop that. Hecht couldn't do anything about it. The next one was lice, or gnats, made from the dust of the earth. Geb was the god of the earth. Thoth was the god of magic. And remember, the magicians of Pharaoh could not reprise. They could not, they could not do the same miracle. And what do they say? It's the finger of God. The finger of God. Then you had the swarms of flies or dung beetles. That would be Kepri, uh, the beetle-headed god. Then there was uh, the destruction of the cattle and the livestock. Hathor was the cow-headed goddess of women and motherhood. Think about that, women. A cow-headed goddess was the mother of uh, was the goddess of women and motherhood. Or Apis, who was the sacred bull and the physical representation of Ta, the creator god. What did the children of Israel in their rebellion when Moses was up on Mount Sinai, what kind of a god did they build out of gold? Do you remember that in the Exodus? It was a golden calf. Thanks, Elaine, because what it was, was it was they remembered what it was like when they were in Egypt for 400 years because the Apis bull was the supreme god representation that they would worship. So they were building, they were reverting back to the Egyptian uh, already to the Egyptian uh, way of uh, uh, religion, if you would. Incredible when you think about that. They go through the ten plagues, the parting of the Red Sea, all of that, and then they still fall. Boils and sores, which was the next one, and that was against Imhotep, the god of healing, and Sekhmet, who was the goddess of healing, and Thoth, the god of medicine. So none of these gods or goddesses could prevent or could counter these various plagues. Hail from the sky. Newt was the goddess of the sky. Set was the god of storms. Horus was the falcon-headed sky god of protection. And Tefnut was the goddess of rain. Locust, Osiris, was the god of crops and fertility. And Nepper was the god of grain. The locust couldn't stop them. And then you had darkness for three days. Remember, Ra was the supreme god. He was the sun god. And Ra was struck dead for three days where they could not see the sun for three days. And finally, the death of the firstborn. And it was a curse against Anubis, who was the god of the dead. But most importantly, it was against Pharaoh himself, who was the god king. The Pharaoh claimed to be god. Not only could he not save his son, but he couldn't raise him from the dead either. So you have all of these various plagues that are reprised and against the, uh, the various gods of Israel, or the gods of Egypt, excuse me. Each of the ten plagues was designed to not only bring terror to the Pharaoh and his people, but also to prove the complete impotence of their deities, their false deities. In each of the plagues, one or more of the Egyptian gods to whom they were directed was proven to be totally powerless to intervene. The last of the ten plagues was the death of the firstborn, including, again, we already said this, uh, the, the God King who couldn't raise his own son. But wait, this is something looking through Jewish eyes that I found some years ago. And uh, I think this is a brick through a plate glass window. You be the judge. This, this absolutely stunned me. And I want to share this with you because this is something that if it's, if it's, if it's true, it's, it's, it's really an amazing thing to behold. Interestingly, following each of the plagues, we read that uh, just as Pharaoh 
was about to relent, his heart was hardened. And subsequently, he refused to let the people go. Remember, there's a number of times that Pharaoh is ready to let them go. But then God hardens his heart. And you might think to yourself, well, what chance did Pharaoh have God hardens his heart, right? Well, there's actually a passage in Romans where Paul actually addresses that very topic. And he says, well, no, God can do what he wants. Pharaoh was already an evil man. Pharaoh, was, Pharaoh thought he was God. He, he worshipped snakes. I mean, he was, he was someone that was already lost. God was using an evil man to bring judgment and to save his people. So it wasn't like he got a bad deal. But here's where it really comes together looking through Jewish eyes. I think this is stunning. The Hebrew word kabed, here translated hardened, hardened Pharaoh's heart in English, is actually better rendered as heavy. In other words, Pharaoh's heart was heavy. I never read this anywhere, but think about this. This is, this is to me, an astonishing thing. To an ancient Hebrew and Egyptian audience, this would have had profound significance. The Egyptians believed that once a person died, he would immediately appear before the jackal-headed god Anubis and have his heart weighed in a scale that was balanced against a feather. The counter object was the feather of truth. And if the heart was found to be lighter, the deceased would enter the afterlife. If, however, it outweighed the feather, the unfortunate man's heart was devoured by the demon Ammit, and the body was thrown into the lake of fire. The Pharaoh's heart being heavy would have been a particularly alarming thing to the Egyptians. And when looking through the lens of the times, contained subtle inference that is probably lost on, on generations to this day. Think about that. His heart being hardened would have meant that he wouldn't have been able to go into the afterlife because it would have been outweighed by the feather of truth. I mean, this is amazing. I think looking through Jewish eyes just absolutely amplifies the text. You be the judge. The true scale of justice. Once again, something that I think is even more amazing. It gets even more crazy. Look at this. The two witnesses. Now, remember in Revelation, the two witnesses have come down uh, during the tribulation period, for the first half of the tribulation period. And I will give power, the Lord says through uh, uh, John in the Apocalypse, I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. If anyone tries to harm the two witnesses, fire, uh, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. These men have power to shut up the, the uh, sky so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. And they have power to turn the water into blood and to uh, strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. That's from Revelation 11. Well, certainly the two witnesses are types, types of Moses and Elijah. Because what does Moses do? He can turn the water into blood, all these different plagues. Elijah shuts up the rain. He calls down fire from the sky. So this is clearly two, uh, in, in the last days, the two witnesses. I argue it's a different class for a different time. I believe it really is Moses and Elijah, that they actually come back. But that's a different class for, for a different time. But I think it is amazing that in any event, there are certainly types of Moses and Elijah. Now, back to the future. This is something that, again, that I found looking through Jewish eyes that I think, again, is stunning. You be the judge. The plagues described in the book of Revelation closely parallel those found in the Old Testament. Look at this. The two witnesses will reprise and help to usher in God's judgment on the evil world while finally bringing the Jewish people to the understanding that Jesus was the Messiah all along. These are the Jews of the Old Testament who come back to witness to the Jews. That's what it's all about. It's the time of Jacob's trouble, the tribulation period. Now, looking through Jewish eyes, New Testament redux. Future apocalyptic events mirror the list of the ten plagues of the Exodus, as is amazingly confirmed when one compares the following side by side. Take a look at this. The first plague was what? Water turned into blood. And the two witnesses have power to turn the water into blood. So they're doing the same thing as was done in the Exodus. That's number one. Number two, frogs. Then I saw three impure spirits 
that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the, of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Again, from Revelation. The third one was dust. Remember, they made the, um, uh, uh, the vermin out of the dust of the ground, and it was the finger of God. And here's from Revelation again. They will throw dust on their heads and will, will weep and mourn and mourning cry out, Woe, woe to you, great city, where all who had ships on the sea became rich through, their, through her wealth. In one hour, she has been brought to ruin. And therefore, in one day, her plagues will overtake her. Death, mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord who judges her. The finger of judgment, the dust in the ground. Wild beasts, including a swarm of flies and beetles. And I'm not going to read all this, but they talk about the scorpions and the flies and all that in the book of Revelation. The uh, next one was the beast, uh, was the pestilence of the cattle. And it talks about how the cattle and all of the different animals are slain during the revelation, during the tribulation period. Boils and sores. The first angel went and poured out his bowl on, on the land, and ugly festering sores broke out on the people. Once again, same as the sixth plague. The seventh one was hail. The first angel uh, sounded his trumpet, and fire, and there, and there uh, came hail and fire mixed with blood. Hail coming from the sky. Locust number eight. And what do we read in Revelation? And out of the smoke, locusts came down. You're having the same plagues in in uh, Exodus being reprised in Revelation. And then, of course, darkness, number nine, which was the, the, uh, the god Ra. And the fourth angel sounded his trumpet, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. And as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shown not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. So here again, you have darkness as the plague number nine. But most importantly, and the one that is really most incredible, is death of the firstborn. And I don't need to read that, but you know who the firstborn of all creation is, before all creation is Christ himself. So here you have God, the Pharaoh God, who can't save his son, but here you have the Son of God, who not only is raised from the dead, but again, obviously, is, is, is the true God for all time. So you've got, in every one of these cases, you've got the plague of the Old Testament being reprised at the end of the New Testament. Reprising the ten plagues. It appears from the apocalypse that the Lord will revisit his divine wrath and judgment upon the wicked, just as he did upon Pharaoh in the land of Egypt. For God's people, the Passover was commanded to be celebrated for all generations. But rather than merely looking back, it should be a time of sobering reflection on the days ahead. By reprising the plagues of Moses in the book of Revelation, it should be understood that God is cautioning mankind that the future is doomed for those who will fail to learn the lessons of the past. And Dan, Note the future. I should never have italics ever again in a slide. I couldn't read those at all. I apologize. It's bad enough rather of italics killed me. All right, so here we go. Wow, right? I mean, isn't that an amazing thing, looking through Jewish eyes? I mean, you've really got, in Revelation, the ten plagues of the Old Testament. Now, from curses to blessings, this is, I don't have time today because we only have till quarter after today, so I, I don't have the time, but I'll reprise this in a couple of coming weeks. I also was able to go back and find in the New Testament, in the Gospels, counters to the ten plagues during the ministry of Jesus. So I'll give you a couple of them as well, because there's one for each of the ten plagues. The book of Revelation is not the only New Testament source with apparent parallels to the plagues of Moses. It is curious that during Jesus' earthly ministry, many of the events described in the Gospels also have a profound similarity. It appears to me that this cannot be a coincidence. Look at this, Christ and the blessings. Moses' first plague was turning water into blood. Jesus' first miracle was turning water into wine. 
In the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper, the wine is symbolic of Christ's blood. In fact, many denominations say that it is Christ's blood. So clearly that, that's an amazing parallel. Look at this one. Christ is the firstborn over all creation, Colossians 1.15, and the son of the living God. And after three hours of darkness for the sun, I would like sun, S-O-N, stop shining. Similarly, after three days of symbolic darkness for the world, Christ Jesus left the blackness of the tomb and was resurrected back to life. It's amazing. And over and over again, we find parallels. We find the dust in the ground of the finger of God. What did Jesus uh, write in the dust of the sand in the, in the temple with the finger of God? Over and over again, every one of the ten plagues, you can find a parallel that Jesus does something uh, in the New Testament and the Gospels that literally would offset these various plagues. And I've got them all in my, in my writing I can share with you. But this is the way that I see Jesus. This is Jesus the way he'll appear to us in the clouds. Because all of the Jews always wore prayer shawls. From the time of Moses, they were instructed to always wear a tallit of prayer shawl. And at the time of Jesus, every male wore a prayer shawl all the time. How often do you see him depicted in movies or in uh, uh, paintings like that? You, you rarely do, right? Well, the reason is by the time people were painting Jesus in the Renaissance, they were all Germans and Frenchmen and Italians and Spaniards, Belgians. But they weren't Jews. They had lost their Jewish roots. They didn't realize that this is the way Jesus would have appeared. Finding Jesus in the Exodus. Now we're going to talk about the Ark of the Covenant. And I want to dedicate the rest of this class to Debbie Rowe. Because Debbie, years and years ago, and not to date Debbie, but I'm the same, is I think it was 30 years ago at Hillside Cinema, you did a class for the ladies. You were, that's right, you were 10. But she's, but she's so precocious, though. She's so precocious. And you did, a, you did a class for the ladies, and, and Lynn was raving about it. And I went and I talked to you about it, and, and this is a lot of what, uh, and you pointed me to a book that uh, is what I'm going to share with here. But again, thank you so much. That was something that 30 years ago stunned and amazed me. The Lord said to Moses, have them make uh, an ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold, both inside and out, and make a gold molding around it. Cast four gold rings for it and fasten them to its four feet uh, with two rings on one side and two rings on the other. Then make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Insert the poles into the rings on the side of the ark to carry it. The poles are to remain in the rings of this ark. They are not to be removed. Then put in the ark the, tab the tablets of the covenant of the law, which I will give you, the Ten Commandments. <laughs> and here's a representation of what the ark may have looked like. The ark of the covenant. Make an atonement cover of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide. And make two cherubim or angels out of hammered gold and at the ends of the cover. Make one cherub on one end and the second cherub on the other. Make the cherubim of one piece with the cover at the two ends. The cherubim are to have their wings spread upward, overshadowing the cover with them. The cherubim are to face each other, looking toward the cover. Place the cover on top of the ark and put in the ark the tablets of the covenant that I will give you. It can certainly be argued that the Ark of the Covenant was the most sacred artifact in Israel. They actually had to build the tabernacle because they had to have a way to house it. Later they built the temple as a permanent place, and so they thought it would be permanent, of course it wasn't, but as a place to house the Ark. That was the most important reason to build the tabernacle and the temple. It may be seen far more sacred than they knew. The Ark, I believe, and I know Debbie Rowe believes, is actually a type, a type of Christ Jesus. Here again is from the Exodus. There above the cover between the two cherubim that are over the ark of the covenant law, I, God, will meet with you, Moses and Aaron, and give you all my commands for the Israelites. Moses and Aaron would go into the into the tabernacle, and they would go to the Holy of Holies, and they would bow down before the ark, and there God would appear to them, typically as fire, on the uh, mercy seat, and they would have the call, the K-O-L, the voice of God, 
and he would give them instruction. So the design of the ark, a type of Christ, you be the judge, is built of acacia wood. It's two and a half cubits in length. A cubit was considered to be the length of your elbow to the to the end of your fingers. I think um, Giannis Antetokounmpo has a much longer cubit than I do, so I don't know if there is really a norm for that, but they were probably pretty much the same. You certainly have the biggest cubit in the room, Jim, so uh, you be the judge. Two and a half cubits. It's one and a half cubit in breadth and height. Overlaid with pure gold within and without. And again, fastened with four gold rings, two per side. <coughs> a pole of acacia wood overlaid in gold, inserted into the rings, and they were never to be removed. Okay, we read all that in the instructions. The mercy seat was an atonement cover or mercy seat of pure gold. There was no wood frame. This was pure gold. There was no wood. The crown molding of gold, again, was two and a half cubits long and one and a half cubit wide. It surrounded the top. The crown molding. Two pure gold cherubim facing each other with wings spread upward overshadowing the cover. The Shekinah glory of God, which would appear typically as a light of some form, fire or whatever, would sit above the mercy seat. And the Ark of the Covenant was to be housed inside the Holy of Holies within the tabernacle or the temple. Acacia wood is considered a plain, hard, durable, and very resistant wood, resistant to heat and decay. It's also considered to be fairly unattractive. You wouldn't use it to make fine furniture, but you'd use it to make industrial things, okay? Interestingly enough, symbolic of Christ in his human form. Humble but durable, Philippians uh, chapter 2, verse 5. Physically unattractive, remember he says there was nothing to attract of us, attract us of the Messiah in Isaiah 53. Incorruptible, decay resistant, of course, his body would not see decay, as Peter talks to the, uh, uh, the assembly on that first Pentecost. Gold overlaid reminds us that Christ Jesus retained his full deity in union with his humanity. He was always God, fully God, and fully man. He doesn't lose his godhood when he becomes man. He gives up some of his attributes so that he can die, that he can be resurrected, that he can be tempted, but he never ceases to be God, and that's the goal in its pure form. He was not half God and half man. He was fully God and man. Then we have the mercy seat of pure gold with no wood assures that only the deity can offer saving grace. Christ Jesus is typified as the blood sprinkled mercy seat. Remember, it's his blood that is, redeems us, and that was where the blood sacrifice would be sprinkled on the mercy seat. The crown encircling the mercy seat, once again, pure gold, no wood, signifies Jesus Christ as king of kings fully God, king of kings. The mercy seat covers the ark fully. It covers it. It's the coverage on the ark, just as Christ's mercy and sacrifice fully covers all of our sins. The four fasteners are nailed to the ark, just as Christ Jesus was nailed to the cross through four of his limbs. The cherubim inwardly face the Shekinah glory where God would appear in reverence and in awe, studying God's revealed plan of salvation. Remember, Peter tells us which things the angels desire to look into. He's talking about, Peter's talking about the Gospels. The angels are stunned. They watch the Gospel. What is, what is the Gospel? It's, it's the agape of God, right? The, the, the perfect love of God in the Greek, the agape. So I wrote one of my classes one time. All the angels' mouths are agape over the agape of God. Because they're looking at this inwardly and they're, and they're amazed by it. We read in Ephesians, his intention, God's intent, was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realm, the angels who would be looking at these things. Resulting that there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And tomorrow is the day of repentance, the day of atonement to the Jews. 
So it's the most symbolic uh, solemn day to the Jews of the entire year. The angels marvel at gospel of God. Even the angels long to look into these things. The ark, symbolic of that. So here we have the Ark of the Covenant. The dimensions of the Ark, again, as we said, epitomize Christ. The length is, as we said, two and a half cubits, or if you take it in the lowest divisible amount given, it'd be five half cubits. The height or the width is one and a half cubits or three half cubits when you divide it the lowest denomination. The vertical uh, girth is six cubits, and the horizontal girth is eight cubits. So this is from... Uh, when you take the lowest uh, divisible uh, units denomination. In the Hebrew gematria, which is their alphanumeric system, all, um, if, if you would, all letters and all numbers have a meaning. For instance, the number six is the number of sin. The Antichrist number is 666 in Revelation. Six is the number of sin. Twelve is the number of human government. That's why there were the 12 tribes. That's why there were 12 apostles human government. Seven is the number of perfection and completion. Seven is the number uh, of perfection. Now, interestingly enough, five is the number of grace. Three is the number of the Trinity. Six is the number of sin or man. I just said that. And eight is the number of new beginnings. If we take the ark, the dimensions of the ark, look at what it actually spells out. The Trinity, three, by grace, five, offers sinful man, six, a new beginning, eight. Wow. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. The contents of the ark. Remember what they were? Who can tell me the three contents of the ark? What's the first one we already said? What was the first one? Tablets of the law, the Ten Commandments. What was another one? Elaine, I know you know. The manna, thank you, I'm sorry. I'm blind and deaf, too. Uh, the manna, yes, the manna in a, in a golden pot. And then the third one was the uh, staff of Aaron that budded. Remember that? So those are the three things that were to be placed in the ark. Well, the stone tablets of the law. The tablets kept within the ark just as Jesus fully kept the law and God's commandments. I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. So in the heart of the ark, you have the Ten Commandments, and of course, Christ Jesus fulfilled the commandments and is the only one that ever did. The blood-sprinkled mercy seat overshadowing and fulfilling the law through the atoning blood of the Lord Jesus. Aaron's rod that budded depicts the resurrection of life from death. Remember, this is just a stick, a wooden rod, and it actually has... Uh, not only does it have uh, life on it, but they're actually like flowers that come from it. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whoever believes in me shall never die. So you actually have Aaron's staff that budded. Then we, that was how they identified him to be the head of the Levites. And then the golden pot of manna. The manna typifies that Jesus uh, is the true bread of life that came down from heaven. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. Your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on, the bread of, on, on this bread will live forever. So here's Jesus again epitomized as the manna. A type of Christ. Housing the ark, as we said a moment ago, they had to build the tabernacle as a place to safeguard and house the ark. This is basically what it may have looked like in terms of the wall around it. And it was a tent, a portable tent that they would carry with them on the march. Well, the tabernacle and the Messiah, you can, you can also say, is epitomized in Christ. The tabernacle was built according to very specific instructions from God. <clears throat> Two master craftsmen were selected. Bezalel from the tribe of Judah and Aholiab of the tribe of Dan. Now that this was kind of intriguing, you be the judge, no coincidences ever. Judah and Dan were the first and the last of the tribes on the march. Every day Judah started and, and Dan was the last of the 12 tribes to go on the march every day. And just as Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. 
Are you getting an idea that looking through Jewish eyes, some of this stuff gets amplified? I hope so. Otherwise, I won't come back next week. <laughs> or you might not. <laughs> the tabernacle, look at this, the tabernacle, the way it was designed. And again, according to very specific instructions, the four coverings. White linen was the first covering, again, symbolizing Christ's purity and righteousness. Sinless, white linen. Covering that was goat's hair. And this would be Christ as the sin offering, the scapegoat. The third one was ram skins dyed red. Of course, Christ is the high priest and as the atoning sacrifice. Rams were sacrificed as burnt offerings, and red, of course, red dye denotes the sacred blood of Jesus. And then finally, the last one, dugongs, whatever dugong skins were. Nobody really knows what a do. George, you know what a dugong was? Did you ever come up with what you think that was? Yeah, the best guess is that they were manatees. Manatees? Okay, that's, that's what I had heard, too. I, and there's a lot of different, yeah, thoughts on it. But there was, in other words, it would have been a really tough hide, some kind of a tough hide, because it would be covering the outer thing, and they wanted to make sure that it was protected. But here again, Dugong, Christ in his humanity covered and protected the tabernacle, just as Christ covers us with his boundless grace, protection, and love. So once again, you even have the, the design of the tabernacle fulfilled in Christ. The curtain is a type of Christ. The curtain and or veil was comprised again of four colors. Blue, blue is the heavenly color. Purple, which was the royal color. Red, the color of blood or sacrifice. And white, the color of purity. Jesus Christ in his deity as a king, the atoning sacrifice, and as the sinless one. These aren't coincidences. This is all stuff that was designed by God. And that's why when Jesus said it is finished on the cross, what's the next thing that happened in the temple when Jesus said that when he died? Right, the, temp the temple curtain was torn, not bottom up, but top down. It was torn top down. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. They said that the curtain of the temple was incredibly thick. And that it would take very, be very difficult for anything to tear it. And it happened, of course, miraculously at that moment. Now, we know why that happened. Because the veil represents Christ's body. We read about this in Hebrews. There's no doubt about it. Therefore, brothers, we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body. You may remember that at the time of Jesus, the Holy of Holies, the only one that could ever go into the Holy of Holies was the high priest. And that was on the Day of Atonement, which actually puts on his tomorrow, is the Day of Atonement. That was the one day a year that anyone could enter the Holy of Holies. And the only one that could do it was the high priest. It was so important that he go in there and that, the, that they were able to get him out again, that they would tie ropes around his ankles to make sure that if he died in there, they could pull him out because no one could go in to get him. Seriously. And they had bells on his tunic that they could hear him walking around. I'm serious about this. This is actually part of the, of the Talmud. And what would actually happen is he would go in that one day of the year and then he would make sacrifice for all the people of Israel, the Day of Atonement. But suffice to say, when, when Zechariah was incensing in the temple and Gabriel comes to him, the angel Gabriel tells him about the birth of John the Baptist. He's not in the Holy of Holies. He's in the most holy. He's in the holy place. That's outside of the curtain. And that's where they did the incensing. And that's where the menorah was. Okay. He was a priest, but he wasn't the high priest. Only the high priest went into the inner place where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. The atonement. The blood sacrifice of Christ, our great high priest allows us to boldly approach the throne of God. We now then, because of that curtain being torn, we no longer had to be separated from God. We could approach the throne of God because the sacrifice had been made. Our high priest. The tabernacle temple, the tabernacle, 40 days Christ church, uh, or portrays Christ church on earth, temporary and portable. The tabernacle, temporary and portable. You might argue the temple illustrates Christ church in heaven, stationary and permanent. The temple and the tabernacle. Now I want to close, as I always do, with a brick through a plate glass window. I think this is astonishing. You be the judge. This is something that uh, 
once again, when we look at Christ in the Old Testament, here's an example of that that I think is just absolutely stunning. Looking through Jewish eyes. What happened when Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden? Remember, something happened. They were cast out, and there was something to prevent them from coming back in. Remember what it was? Cherubim. Angels were posted at the, at the, at the uh, gate, if you would, in the Garden of Eden, to keep Adam and Eve from coming back to approach the... the uh, uh, the uh, tree of life to approach the throne of God ostensibly. Okay, so they were separated. We know that it was at least two because it was cherubim, plural, in Genesis. This picture by Dore only has one, but the other one's behind the tree, I think. There's two of them because that's what it was. It was cherubim, two that separate man from God. God is a holy God. God is a holy God, and he could have no fellowship with anything that wasn't holy. So as a consequence, man now had sinned, and God could not have fellowship with man until the Redeemer would come to pay the price. He already establishes in the garden, already establishes before they even leave the garden, how they're going to be saved. He tells them that a Redeemer is going to come and is going to crush the head of the serpent who will bite his heel. And you actually have it all laid out because it was laid out in eternity past before man was even created. But here you have cherubim, two angels, standing at the gate of Eden, keeping man out, keeping man from God symbolically. Fair enough? On the curtain in the temple, the curtain that separated the Holy of Holies where the Ark was, a type of Christ, you had this giant curtain. And they had cherubim, angels, that were embroidered symbolically on the curtain. Once again, symbolically to keep man out, to keep man from the Holy of Holies, from the throne of God where God would appear is a good representation of what it would have looked like. Once again, here's some more. Angels, again, embroidered on the curtain separating man from God. And the Ark of the Covenant would have been back inside on the other side of that curtain with the angels embroidered on the front. And then you have the Ark, once again, where God would appear. What do we have again? Cherubim, angels, who are flanking the mercy seat and overshadowing it and looking inwardly. Once again, separating symbolically man from God. You see how this all works with the cherubim? Well, cherubim, keeping man from the throne of God. Early on the first day of the week, early on the first day of the week, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices uh, so that they might come and anoint him. This, of course, is Easter morning, Sunday morning. Very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had set, had risen. They were, uh, they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? Looking up, though, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, although it was extremely large. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. Question, why was the stone rolled away? I'll let that perk there. Just think about that. Carl, think about that. We're going to have a test in a moment. <laughs> why was the stone rolled away? Think about that for a minute. Remember now, the, the women are coming cautiously. They're, they're cautiously wondering what's going on here. They come and they approach it. They approach the open tomb. And this light emanates from the tomb. And they look inside and they see two beings, cherubim, two angels. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see where he lay. Come and see where he lay. And they go into the tomb. Remember, they go in and they come down and they look. And they see that he's not there. He is risen. Cherubim, two angels. Well, why was the stone rolled away? To let Jesus out? <laughs> no, it was to let the women in. For the first time now, man could approach the throne of God because the curtain had been torn, the sacrifice had been made, it is finished. Here's two angels now saying, no, you can't come in, saying, come in and see where he lay. And the blood of Christ, the blood of Christ is in the tomb on the sheets. On the, uh, on the shroud of Christ, laying there 
on where he was buried, where he, where he was laid. Cherubim were no longer keeping men and women from the throne of God. Christ had died in our place and risen from death as our Savior and High Priest. The curtain, as we said, in the temple was torn. We now may approach boldly, boldly approach the throne of God. Consider this. Consider this. This is stunning. Now Mary stood outside the tomb, crying. As she wept, she bent over and looked into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been. One at the head and the other at the foot. One at the head and the other at the foot. Dare I say again, one at the head and the other at the foot. Symbolically, the living embodiment of the Ark of the Covenant. Angels on each side of the blood of the Christ. Wow. The Ark of the Covenant literally embodied in the tomb of Jesus. So looking through Jewish eyes, I thought about this, and I thought this is such an amazing thing. And I wonder, one of the questions I want to ask the Lord, I wonder if the two angels in the Garden of Eden that kept man out are the same two, are the same two angels that appeared in the Garden tomb. Wow. Wouldn't that be cool if they got that mission? They get to go back to the tomb and let mankind in forevermore. So the Lord quoted and taught from the Old Testament scriptures in order to explain how everything points to him. Everything points to him. Discovering Jesus on the road to a mass. Finding Christ Jesus in the Old Testament. Next week we're going to do more of this, God willing. And uh, there's, it's replete. There are so many things. Next week we're going to talk about from uh, the book of Daniel, how Jesus is throughout the book of Daniel. And it's amazing when we, uh, when we look at it through Jewish eyes. So once again, Walking on the Road to a Mass, part three next week, October 1st, I hope you'll join us. To God alone the glory. And thank you. We're out right on time. See you in church. God bless. To God the glory.